Hello everyone, welcome to FitRx. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Dennis. And as you know, this is a show about optimizing your health. I am all the time looking for the latest and greatest uh, thing just to make me healthier, and then I try to take that information and share it with you. So in my uh, recent reading, I uh, came across some people doing some really high doses of vitamin D to not only make one healthier, but actually um, cure some, some diseases. And so I, I came across a book uh, titled The Miraculous Cure and Prevention of All Diseases, What Doctors Never Learned. <laughs> the author of this book is Jeff Bowles, and he is with us today to talk about this book and other books he's written, uh, mostly about vitamin D. So Jeff, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks. Uh, it's nice to be here. All right. So you have written several books uh, in, in the, the realm of health and, and aging. Uh, you wrote one, I believe it was titled The Miraculous Results of High-Dose Vitamin D. And then the one that, that caught my eye was The Miraculous Cure and Prevention of All Diseases, What Doctors Never Learned, and that title just, just caught my eye. I actually found this book because I had just read a book um, by, what was his name, uh, Dr. Somerville. Are you familiar with him? Justin I've Somerville. Heard, yeah, I've heard that name. Okay. So he wrote a book titled The Optimal Dose. So it was. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I see his book uh, on the best selling list uh, of Amazon. His book is always near mine's. So I always see it uh, in the top 100 here and there. Yeah. So I read that book, and he talked a lot about, you know, really high doses of vitamin D, and then that's what, what made me found uh, or find your book. Uh, and you, you actually kind of go into more detail. And, and what I liked about your book is you actually mentioned, which we're going to talk about, but you mentioned also a little bit about magnesium, vitamin K2, uh, and, and some other things which I believe are important. Yeah. Yeah, boron, zinc, and beta carotene. It turns out there's five cofactors you need to take with vitamin D3. Yeah, yeah. So, so we'll get into all that. Okay. Um, and so, you know, I, I learned a lot from this, and I'm intrigued, and, and I'm, you know, hoping to learn along with the listeners here because I feel like compared to most physicians out there, I'm pretty aggressive when it comes to vitamin D. Uh, I at least check it, which most most physicians aren't even checking a vitamin D level. Um, and I'm also encouraging people to take vitamin K2, and I also encourage magnesium. What was new to me with all this is just the much, much higher doses that than most people recommend or most doctors recommend, and so, so we can get into all that. But uh, before we do, so... Uh, just explain to our audience, you know, a little bit about your background, how you came to writing books like this. I mean, what was your motivation into just studying about vitamin D and other vitamins and, and writing these books? Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess I'll give you, I'll try and give you a short synopsis. But uh, I started out, I come from a long line of doctors, I'm mostly all educated at Stanford, and I was going to go to school to be a pre-med and uh I didn't like chemistry my first semester, so I switched to business and uh, got an MBA at Northwestern uh, in Chicago. And the year I, year after I graduated, luckily it, for me, it shot up in rank from like number eight to number one. That was a nice bonus. Uh, and I got my CPA and I made a bunch of money in real estate by the time I was 28, 29. And I guess, uh, medicine was just in my blood. And I, I said, you know what, I've got enough money for a while. So I, I pretty much semi retired out of real estate, went back to undergrad at age 26, 27, and was taking uh, biochem uh, uh, classes and biology classes. I started off in bio 101, age 26, 27, maybe. And uh, so bottom line, I mean, I, I, the date, the years aren't exact. I was doing a little working while going to school. And but, so it all, you know, basically by the time I was 30, I was mostly in school full time. And uh, I would take one class a semester to make sure I learned it quite well. And I'd set the curve in every class and made the uh, uh, 
pre-meds like yourself made made them angry because <laughs> I, I brought the curve way up. Um, and then uh, I was like one class away from getting my biochem degree after about five or six years. And I, I just got tired of like the Krebs cycle memorization. You, you remember all that stuff? Oh, the yeah. Oh, God, I was about to puke. And I said, that's it. I can't take this. I quit. And I quit right in the middle of uh, biochem too. And I, then I just went over to Northwestern Med School Library, spent like 10 years straight, seven days a week, sometimes 12 hours a day, just reading abstracts uh, out of medical journals and, and full articles, even old articles back from the 20s. I'd have to get out of the basement. Uh, I, my plan was, oh, I'm just going to find a cure for aging. I mean, I thought back then I thought I could do anything. And I just thought that would be kind of a fun thing to do. And I always go full bore on whatever I uh, undertake back then. I was quite a workaholic. And doing all of this one day, I just uh, was comparing the two diseases of, that look like programmed aging. Have you heard of progeria where those kids turn into grandparents by age 12, like little old men? Yeah, right. right. Yeah. And then there's another rapid aging disease that kicks in when you're at age of puberty called Werner syndrome. And by the, t by the time they look normal as a teenager, but the time, by the time they're like 40, they look like they're 85 or 90. I compared those two diseases, the, the cell, the, the DNA in both those cells. I go, aha, I've got it. And then, uh, I, that led to like a big long paper that I submitted to a medical journal that had like four or five, Nobel Prize winners on their staff, and it was seven times longer than their limit. And I had no credentials except an MBA and a CPA. And they accepted it for accelerated publication because they thought it was extremely exciting and of major importance. And that paper uh, predicted if you suppressed luteinizing hormone, it would be a good treatment for Alzheimer's. And then uh, so, someone formed a company right around that time and that idea had never been out in in the public before and they did get it out of my paper i found out later but they started a company and raised 50 million dollars and were treating all these people for alzheimer's by suppressing their luteinizing hormone with lupron and then uh they raised 50 million and they found out it worked in women in a phase two trial and they were going public, but then it turns out it didn't work in men. And uh, so the company collapsed, but that's how I got into medical research. And then, um, and then after that, I, I've also lift weights and stuff. And I had bad shoulders in my thirties, they kind of hurt. And I read this article in life extension magazine that said, uh, people with achy joints tend to have low D3 levels and they're much, they're helped with vitamin D3. So then I, I decided, oh, I'll, I'll take 4,000 a day because they're saying back then uh, the daily requirement or daily recommendation was 400 international units. Mm -hmm. And so I go, I'm always like, you know, let's go for it. I'm, I'll take 10 times that amount and see if, see if I get some relief. And lo and behold, I was taking 4,000 a day and uh, those cracking shoulders that I had, they quit cracking. And uh, that was, for me, that was a miracle. I could go back to weightlifting and there, there was no problem, but it didn't do much, didn't really do much else for me. Except, and I, I stayed at that dose for about 10 years. And, um, <clears throat> but the one thing that happened during the 10 years is I, I never got a single cold. And then I used to get like two or three colds a year, like most people. And then, um, and then after about 10 years of that, I finally convinced my dad to take like 2000 uh, units a day. And he was a doctor, didn't believe in vitamins like most doctors <laughs> that you probably run into. Sure. And uh, he used to say, oh, it just gives you expensive urine. And uh, so I finally got him to take 2000 a day and then they finally tested his blood for vitamin D, which they hadn't been doing ever. And uh, his vitamin D level came back at 30 nanograms per milliliter, which is the lo lowest end of the reference range. Mm -hmm. In the US, our reference range is 30 to 100. If you're in between there, you're considered normal. Um, but, and so he was taking 2000 and I was taking 4000 and I thought, wow, 
maybe we have some kind of genetic problem absorbing D3, but you know, if he's taking 2000 and he's not barely boosting his D3 levels, I better take some more. So that's when I decided to do an experiment. I really didn't know much about it. I just said, I'm going to take 20,000 a day and see what happens. Now, did you know what your level was taking 4,000? No, day? no, I hadn't, never got it hadn't done any blood tests or anything, just kind of winging it okay. in it. Um, but at the same time I was, so once I started this experiment, I went back into my research mode. Like I had been at Northwestern med school library and I just started reading every abstract I could on vitamin D3. And I was starting to realize, whoa, this stuff is amazing. It turns out it's not a vitamin at all. It's actually a hormone. And it was just mislabeled as a vitamin because it was discovered after vitamin C. And, uh, and the dogs they fed it to could get it from cod liver oil. And they raised the dogs indoors. And a definition of a vitamin is you can't make it in your body by yourself. You have to get it through your diet. Mm -hmm. So they, the dogs got... Uh, uh, by giving the d dogs raised indoors cod liver oil, it prevented them from getting rickets, which is uh, in humans, we call it bow legs. Like mm -hmm. their legs are all bowed out because they, they, their bones don't form properly. And they found cod liver oil prevents that in dogs. And then, but later they found out if you just raise the dogs out in the sunlight, uh, they didn't get rickets either. So it turns out D3 is not a vitamin. But, and it really should, they should probably change the name. I came up with an idea of like immunotropin because it, it, it's a hormone that controls your immune system and your tissue remodeling system. And one of the abstracts I saw in my research uh, that some doctors were calling vitamin D3 was known as the bone and joint remodeling hormone. And uh, that was helpful to know during my experiment of 20,000 a day because after about three weeks, my shoulders just started killing me. And like, it felt like someone hit me with a sledgehammer <laughs> and, and both shoulders. And those are the ones that were kind of injured before and the clicking stopped when I took 4,000 a day. But once I was up to 20,000, oh, they were killing me after three weeks. And then uh, I also had had a hip click for about 20 years, that's a lot of athletes get them. I played a lot of soccer mm -hmm. and rugby and you do a lot of kicking. It's also called dancer's hip where you get a bone spur on like your hip bone. And uh, whenever the iliopsis tendon rubs over it, you get a clicking noise. And a lot of people have that. And once you get it, you really can't get rid of it. And I tried for 20 years. I had like deep tissue massage until I was bruised. That didn't work. And then I read up on it on the, uh, internet it said that doctors would uh, have had surgery for it they would relax your iliopsis tendon but it wasn't didn't have that great an outcome the those surgeries so I said I'll pass on that and then uh, so all oh, like another week or two into this uh, high dose d3 experiment all of a sudden that hip started hurting like crazy and like where I had that hip click. So there I am, I'm limping around and my, I can barely lift my arms. And most people would have quit. But since I'd read that it's the bone and joint remodeling hormone, I figured, you know what, I bet it's remodeling my, my problems. So I took ibuprofen to get through the pain and I stuck with it. And then I had to stop, I had to stop D3 for a week or two, just because the pain was so bad. And then, uh, then, I, then I would start back up again. And boom, after about two months of this, my shoulders like completely resolved and the hip click disappeared. It, I, it basically dissolved the uh, bone spur on my hip. And then I've heard from other people since. Oh, so then I wrote a book about it. Oh, and then other things happened over a one year period. Uh, I, I had those yellow toenails you get. It's that fungus that gets under your toenails. Like, uh -huh. I picked that up in the gym when in my 20s and I, I never could get rid of it. I tried all the home remedies like soaking it in apple cider vinegar. I, I even, uh, I, I was going to start taking that Lamisil, I think it's called. It, it, and, but there's a, a side effect in some people. It destroys your liver, which I thought didn't sound like a good gamble. <laughs> and uh, so I started taking that after first a couple of days, my tendons started hurting in my hands 
And I said, this doesn't seem good. So I, I said, I'm not going to do that. And then uh, <clears throat> what else? Then I read about the laser you could do on the yellow toenails. That, that was supposed to be good. And so I, I would actually file down my toenails with uh, a, an emery board. And I'd go up on the roof and I'd, I'd do my own variation of it. I would get a magnifying glass and like, I'd, like focus it on the toenail back and forth. I do that for a long time. Nothing fixed my yellow toenails. But I've noticed about after five or six months of, uh, I took even higher doses of vitamin D. I started after three months, I went up to 50,000 and later 75,000. And uh, it was during this time I noticed, oh my God, my toenails are growing in clear. So basically, this D3 had zapped, uh, had revved up my immune system enough where it just started killing off the, the yellow fungus under my toenails without any, uh, oh, and uh, without any other treatments. I didn't need to do anything except take uh, vitamin D3. I had a friend who took, he had the nastiest toenails and uh, he, he just started taking 20,000 a day and then his toenail just started growing out like a brand new baby's toenail. Mm. I've got a picture of it on one of my websites, but I'll tell you about that later. So you just started doing some basically self-experimentation on, on this higher dose vitamin D. And, and after that, is that when you wrote the book? Yeah. Yeah. So I was, uh, I was reading all these abstracts over an entire year. There were like 70,000 at the time. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm becoming an expert on this. And, uh, uh, Oh, after the, th first three months of taking 20,000 units a day, I finally had a blood test and uh, my vitamin D3 level came back at 125. So, and I've heard from, there's another doctor who read my book. He's in Germany and, and he, he, he noticed uh, that well, he's using it on his patients and he noticed that uh, you don't get the remodeling effect or cure for your diseases unless you get your blood level to 125 or higher. Uh, so the reference range keeps keeps the keeps you with at a D3 level where it's not going to heal you or fix your diseases. <laughs> so that's mm -hmm. that's convenient for big pharma and the medical industry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, he he his name's Dr. Harold Shell. Shell. He wrote a book about how he uses uh, D3 for glaucoma and it's been translated into English. You can get that on Amazon, but he describes how he had a fistula and he was so shocked because he was supposed to get surgery for it. That's like a opening between your bladder and your intestine or something like that. Mm -hmm. And the, the fluids go back and forth or whatever. But he, he was taking enough vitamin D3 to get his blood level above 125 and he noticed uh, his fistula just uh, closed up on its own. And then the, his other doctor friends were telling him, oh no, you need surgery. And uh, so he wrote a book about it and he uses it now to treat his patients for glaucoma. He, he quit using glaucoma medicine. And um, yeah, so basically I did a full year of research. Um, another thing that happened to me was I had a subcutaneous cyst on my face. It wasn't that, that big, but it's like a little pimple that never pops. And that, uh, I had that for 20 years. The doctors couldn't do much. They said that it should be cut out and I'd have a scar. And uh, another guy tried to just lance it and take the oil out and just saw it was always annoying. And after about nine months, I think I was taking about nine months of this D3, I was taking about 80,000 a day at that point. I was just sitting there on my bed watching TV one day and all of a sudden I felt my face and there's this oil running down my face. I go, what? And I touched that cyst and it was, it was gone. I mean, it had just kind of ruptured on its own. And then uh, I had a ganglion cyst on my wrist. Uh, those are like a little balloons that pop up. I used to call them Bible bumps because you could smash them with the Bible and they'd go away for a while. And that thing shrunk down to the size of a pea. And it's been like that ever since. Oh, and then so I've been taking D3 for another 10 years after the first 10 years, but much higher doses. And I still, I've, I've only had one cold in the last 20 years. And that was during a period of time when I, I decided to wash the D3 out of my system for a couple months. So if I hadn't done that, I could probably say I haven't had a cold in 20 years. Okay. And, 
so I wrote the book after all, all these amazing things and I wrote about it and then put the book out there all of a sudden, you know, after a while it became a bestseller and then people started telling, sending me emails about their high dose D3 experiments. And so I started to hear all sorts of crazy things uh, that people had this, uh, experienced after taking high dose D3, like one blind, one, a guy that was blind in one eye, I'll tell you that story later, but um, uh, so that was the second book that you read is the result of my research for the first book and then about another nine years of hearing back from over a thousand other people about how high dose D3 had affected them and almost like all, always it's in a good way and it's cured many diseases. It turns out high dose D3, Dr. Coimbra from Brazil He's got a protocol. If you Google it, the Dr. Coimbra protocol, he gives any autoimmune uh, patient, anyone suffering from any autoimmune disease, he gives them a thousand international units per kilogram of body weight. And he has cured every autoimmune disease it's gone up against. So, I mean, there's, he's got, there's more than a hundred thousand people around the world that have cured themselves of MS. And that there's a bunch of Facebook groups that you can go, talk to them there's like there's at least a hundred thousand people in the Facebook groups you just type in uh, Coimbra D3 and multiple sclerosis and you can talk to all these people who have cured themselves with uh, yeah you, and, you have a, a ton of testimonials in the book um, well let, let's talk a little bit more uh, about vitamin D you know as a clinician like I mentioned earlier <coughs> I actually check vitamin D which a lot of doctors don't even check and man, just about everybody is vitamin D deficient. And we're talking less than 30. And I find <laughs> some that are in the teens, or I've even had some less than 10, uh, which is really, really low. So in your research, why as a society are we so vitamin D deficient? Is it just lack of sun? Uh, I think, well, it's uh, like sunscreen. Uh, we probably weren't that D3 deficient up until the eight, 1980s. And then uh, our scientists, good scientists, warned us about how awful the sun was. And uh, we must use sunscreen and wear a hat and stay out of the sun. And that, uh, that is just causing the entire population's D3 levels to crash. I wrote one paper. Um, it's on my website. It's titled... Uh, overwhelming proof that vitamin D3 deficiency causes most human diseases. Um, and it's about, it shows how, uh, it's got graph after graph that shows every known, almost every known disease that affects people under the age of 70 uh, has been skyrocketing since around 1980. You know, like you, obviously we all know about obesity. Mm -hmm. But asthma, autism, multiple sclerosis, all the cancers, pediatric cancers. I, mean, I never used to hear of peanut allergies when I was a kid in the 70s. And now they're supposedly very common. Um, just everything's been skyrocketing. And it all goes back to uh, this advice to stay out of the sun and uh, to use sunscreen. And I don't know if that was an accidental thing that the scientists did because it, do you want me to go into the conspiracy theory? <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. All right. So Casimir Funk in the 1920s, he's the father of all our vitamins. He discovered vitamin D3 and also a, a weaker form called D2 that's made by plants. Like if you shine a sun lamp on mushrooms, you'll get vitamin D2. That's uh, very similar to D3. It's just weaker and it's not as safe for humans to take in high doses. I would recommend never take vitamin D2. Um, D3 is the animal form that we make in our skin when we sit in the sun. And uh, so basically uh, it was known back in the 1920s as the sunshine vitamin everybody started taking it they were putting it in hot dogs and beer this is all this is all you read this in my book right right uh -huh. yeah yeah so that's the beginning of the book is the history of this d3 
and uh, they were putting in everything. They were irradiating milk because that, that caused the milk to make vitamin D2 um, or maybe D3 since it came from a cow, but uh, they'd shine it on mushrooms. So basically uh, then people were taking, back then they were taking, a lot of people were just taking 25 milligrams a day of vitamin D3 or vitamin D. It could have been a mix of D2 or D3. And uh, the weird thing was, uh, according to this one doctor who knew, uh, he, he's passed away by now, but I read his statements. He said back then they were taking so much D3 that the hospitals in the 1920s became empty. And that the hospitals had been way overbuilt in the 1920s. They were trying to turn it into a profitable industry, the medicine, the medical world, because most medicine had been done in people's houses up until that point. And they built all these hospitals and they, we had way more hospital beds per person back then in the twenties than we do now, now. And they were expecting all these patients to make all this money and the hospitals were empty. So what did modern medicine do back then? Well, not modern, the 1920s scientists in medicine back then, what, what did they do? Did they just close up their hospitals? No, instead they uh, they recalibrated 25 milligrams of vitamin D uh, and they renamed it or remeasured it and they now it's 25 milligrams became one million international units mm. and uh, they told everyone do not take more than 400 units a day or otherwise it's dangerous and they had some weird a few weird studies they pointed to where they some animals were killed with high dose D3 but it turns out there is probably mixed with the various impurities, but, uh, and so the, the population little by little just, uh, was brainwashed into only taking 400 units a day. And that's just enough. They figured to, uh, where it kept children from developing rickets in their legs. So if you just, you gave babies 400 units a day, it would pre protect them from rickets, but it didn't do, it didn't, it didn't put them in optimal health at all. And, but that was considered the limit. And that was promoted as the limit all the way up until about 10 years ago, that they were still saying that it's, it's just crazy. And then, uh, so the hospitals filled up again and modern medicine and big pharma are back in the, back in the, back in business, back in money, back in <laughs> business. And then, uh, then they started using these uh, UV lamps, uh, sun lamps, uh, back in the, the third forties and fifties or and thirties, they, there's a bunch of ads in my book about, they call them health lamps and health, uh, health bulbs. And they actually did work. And, uh, but little by little, the medical field uh, referred to them as uh, quack medical devices. And then people finally quit using them in the, oh, like late 60s and 70s. And you can see them on eBay now for sale, antique quack medical devices, but they actually worked because they made vitamin D in your skin. And so then I guess people were sunbathing a lot like me in the 60s and 70s with my parents. And uh, we never used any sunscreen. We used copper tone and coconut oil or coconut butter and uh, got nice dark tans. It was always considered trendy to have a nice tan. And that's when they came up with sunscreen. So, and then all this, this entire time, the, the, Scientists, scientists or big pharma, they, they've been, you know, always trying to outlaw high dose D3. And I got the whole history in my book. So they, it's they've, medicine's been hostile to D3 since day one. And there's still a lot of doctors who don't even realize they've been brainwashed at med school. Like, oh, don't, you know, if, you, if your blood level's over 50, that's, you know, uh, that's D3 toxicity, they, they, I hear a lot of them say. And it turns out vitamin D3 is completely non-toxic. There's nothing toxic about D3. So it really shouldn't be called D3 toxicity. The only danger of D3 is it can uh, deplete your vitamin K2 because it, it uses up cofactors when it's doing all its wonderful work. And when it uses up too much of your K2, uh, that leads to hypercalcemia where you get too much calcium in your blood. And that's when they talk about D3 toxicity, they're really talking about calcium in your blood. So if you test your blood calcium when you're taking high doses and your calcium's normal, you've got nothing to worry about. Then the other uh, 
thing they call D3 toxicity, and they get it confused. They assume it's associated with calcium, but it's not. It's a magnesium deficiency. So vitamin D3 also uses up your magnesium really fast because it's, it's using it to do repairs and whatever. And 80% of us are basically magnesium deficient, and it's not tested for by doctors because yeah. they, they look at the blood test, which right. is worthless. Yeah, you can't really uh, the, test for that. It's difficult. The, the magnesium deficiency is in your tissue, so you right. need a muscle biopsy if you really want to know. Right. And no one does that. But so the other negative effects of high-dose D3 that they call D3 toxicity are really magnesium deficiency symptoms, which could be heart arrhythmias, uh, blood pressure changes, dizziness, falls. They talk about a lot of falls in the elderly when they take high-dose D3. What they're really seeing is uh, magnesium deficiency symptoms. And so we're taught in medical school that you know, vitamin D is one of the fat soluble vitamins and therefore your body can't get rid of excess amounts like it can something like a vitamin C. That's and true. So you're saying though that that's, I mean, it, it, it will, yeah, it's no, it will stay in your body. So like, uh, I know this one guy, I, I know of two cases of hypercalcemia out of the thousand people I've heard from. And these guys were idiots. They hadn't read my book. They weren't taking vitamin K2. One was taking 600,000 units a day over like five or six months to try and cure his ankylosing spondylitis. That's that hunchback disease where where your bones crunch you up. And he was getting all this pain relief. He started at lower doses and went higher and higher. And then finally, uh, he got hypercalcemia around uh, six months in taking 600,000 units a day and it nothing really happened to him except he got nauseous he couldn't eat was vomiting lost a lot of weight had to go in uh, the doctors told him stop taking the vitamin d3 and uh he didn't even have to go on an iv some people have to dilute their blood to the calcium out of their blood with an iv but he didn't and so he just stopped taking it and they so he had to wait and t- keep testing his blood for the uh, D3 levels to go down. And it took like six weeks to get get back down close to 100. Like he was way up there, like three or 400, something like that. But so it's like a a slow motion, you know, once you get the D3 in your fat, it's gonna be there for a while. But Mm -hmm. after, if you stop the D3, it'll take like a six weeks or or two months to to come down. Well, let's talk about the increased immunity with uh, you know healthy levels of D3, and that's a topic <laughs> nowadays with COVID going around, and there's been some, I've seen some studies out there, and this hasn't, you really don't see this much on the media, but I've seen some about, uh, uh, you know, COVID uh, mortality and, and low vitamin D, and so there's definitely a connection there, and there's a connection with vitamin D and immunity. And I think you mentioned in your book, uh, I think I got this from there, that vitamin D is 10 times more effective at preventing flu than the vaccine. Right. So talk about just how vitamin D increases your immune system and, you know, how it and how that relates, in, you know, today to COVID and those kinds of things. Well, yeah, let me just give, give you a slight uh, intro to that is uh, – I wrote a book that's been banned by Amazon. It was on, it was available for like two weeks. It got all five star reviews. It's called uh, the 16 fascinating COVID-19 and Spanish, Spanish flu mysteries solved. And I, I, I came up with 16 like really crazy puzzle pieces that, that didn't make any sense about these pandemics and stuff. But once you solve the one factor that runs through all 16 of them, uh, you find out, oh, it's vitamin D3 that's, uh, that, that, that answers all these uh, 16 puzzles simultaneously. And uh, what I've learned writing that book was uh, the only people dying from COVID-19 are the, the people with the really low D3 levels, like 10, 15. And, uh, and there's a direct correlation. The higher your D3 level, the less likely you are to die, and then the less severe your symptoms. Um, and then one doctor, an emergency room doctor, tested all the COVID patients coming in to his hospital, more than 400, and he found not a single COVID patient was admitted that had a vitamin D3 level 
uh, over 40. So anyone who had a D3 level over 40, which isn't that high, uh, you're not going to end up in the hospital. And then uh, the only people that died had levels under 30. And uh, then there's another uh, study. They just came out in Spain in September. Um, it was a randomized controlled. So it's like the doctors didn't know who was getting what. And they had a group of, did you hear about this one? The group of 50 that got high dose D3 and the other group of 26 that didn't. Did you hear about that study? I don't think so. Oh, all right, good. This will be good for you. Well, they gave both groups so the treatment of the day, which they thought was hydrochloroquine and zinc. So they uh -huh. both groups got that. Okay. And then the 50 of them got high dose D3. I think they started off with 100,000 units and then they, they were, then they were giving them like 50,000 every other day. And the uh, 26, uh, the other, the control group got no D3. And what they found was uh, in the group of 50, oh, in the group of 26, 13 of them ended up in the intensive care unit. So these were people that were like just admitted to the hospital for COVID. So half of them got admitted to the ICU and two of them died. Now in the group of 50, guess how many ended up in the ICU? Zero. Guess none. Zero. And guess how many died? Zero. Oh, I'm sorry. Not one person ended up in the ICU. Sorry. One. And guess how many died? Zero. So they had two deaths in the 26, zero in the 50. 13 ICUs in the 26 and only one in the 50 that were getting high dose D3. And uh, so that's a reduction in ICU admissions by 96%. That sounds significant to me. <laughs> I think that's uh, outside. I don't know the this off the top of my head. Right. Yeah. So I don't know this off the top of my head without researching it, but um, what is the physiology behind the, oh, uh, the higher doses of vitamin D on yeah, I was just, immunity. Do you know? Yes, I do. I was just researching that uh, recently. It's very interesting. In fact, uh, I'll just tell you, uh, you know, Donald Trump made that miraculous recovery. Um, mm -hmm. yep. He was taking uh, six different things and that they were all blaming it on uh, blaming his recovery on Regeneron's antibodies. But uh, they also mentioned he was taking vitamin D3. And I heard it just once in passing on Fox News. A doctor said, I have personal knowledge that he's taking 50,000 units of D3 every other day. And, I, and then I believe that is what really did it. And uh, I've, uh, I have other anecdotal evidence that, uh, that high dose. I mean, you, you got that Spanish study right there. I mean... But, you know, maybe the combo of the antibodies and the D3, but you can actually use high dose vitamin D3 as a treatment for uh, COVID if you catch it. Just, uh, just start taking 50,000 a day and uh, it should knock it out within a few days. And the way it works is basically we all have two major adaptive immune systems that respond to novel viruses. The first one is your your T cells, your killer T cells that are made by your thymus. And those are the, that's the best defense. And so they're out there looking at all your cells. If they detect a virus infected cell um, and they're working properly, they'll latch onto it uh, within an hour and a half, they'll kill it. So uh, if your immune system's in good shape, like when you're taking high dose D3 like me, your killer T cells are just out of control. And that's why I haven't had almost, I've only had one cold in 20 years. And I got a website that where uh, you can search through a thousand different high dose D3 testimonials at jefftbowles.com. I got a, you know, can D3 cure your disease? It's a search engine you can use. And you just type in colds and you'll see it, it's a common story. Everybody says, I haven't been sick in five years, this and that that everyone's sick around me. I don't get sick. Yeah. So it's like when you got a lot of D3 in your system, your killer T cells, that's actually known as the CD8 uh, uh, cell that's made by your thymus. Uh, those things are like 
those are jacked up and ready to go. And it turns out when a CD8 or killer T cell uh, uh, is activated by finding an infected, uh, a, a viral infected cell in your body, that's when it displays its vitamin D receptors. And it needs those D, D receptors to be uh, 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 joined to a vitamin D molecule. Uh, there's a why evolution did it this way as a whole different story, which I explain in my first book. So I won't get into that. But uh, so if the D vitamin D is like high at high levels in your blood, as soon as that killer T uh, cell displays its D3 receptors, boom, the D3 is there. And that uh, that helps coordinate 500 genes at least in the killer T cell that is involved in uh, figuring out how to uh, kill this virus infected cell. So uh, your killer T cells can knock stuff out in an hour, an hour and a half. Now, if that's not, if you don't have enough D3 and it's not working right, it's not gonna do it as fast. It might not do it at all. Then you got your backup system, which is your B cells uh, that make antibodies and they do it inside your bone marrow. And what happens is your thymus makes another set of cells called CD4 that, that gets like a sample of the virus and takes it down into your bones and presents it to the B cells in your bone marrow. So this is a lengthy process. And then your bone, then your bone marrow cells have to, they call it B cells because it comes from your bone marrow. I like to think of it as your backup immune system. And, um, uh, and then it takes five to 30 days to make those antibodies. So, so and, and also the B cells have the same thing. They, they have vitamin D receptors that need to be activated for them to do their work properly. So when you have a lot of vitamin D in there, it's, it's gonna, it basically revs up your immune system. It gives your immune system glasses. Like your immune system doesn't have eyes. So it's, it's looking at stuff like, is this good or bad? Should I kill it or let it go? So, you know, when it's out of focus, it can't see right, it's going to attack some of your good tissues, you get that. And the things that attack your good tissues are actually CD8 cells. Those are what's attacking your intestines when you've got Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. They're like renegade uh, killer T cells that are attacking the wrong stuff. That's why, uh, oh, and then uh, that happens in myasthenia gravis, and in fact, this uh, kind of a primitive medical procedure they use to treat myasthenia gravis is they cut out your thymus, but that doesn't sound too smart. Um, and then, uh, but so high doses of D3 basically tunes your immune system up so it sees everything properly. So it, it stops it, it, and it's actually a cure for all autoimmune diseases. Did I mentioned Dr. Coimbra yet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, I mean, and, and there's like case, it's, you know, you can look up Dr. Quimber protocol and see before and after pictures. It cures uh, lupus, it cures psoriasis. He's got before and after pictures, vitiligo, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, MS, you, just it's the whole list. And uh, uh, so spell, basically spell his it, name. It, oh, yeah, it's C-O. In case uh, listeners want to do that. Yeah, it's Dr. Coimbra, C-O-I-M-B-R-A. He's got lots of YouTube videos. You can just t look up Dr. Coimbra protocol on Google. I use Bing. Google censors too much medical information these days. Um, you can do him on Facebook, and you'll find him many different ways. And there's a lot of before and after pictures now. He's got, uh, he's got a bunch of doctors working with him all over the uh, world the Coimbra elves, I call them. But uh, so basically it tunes up, oh, it tunes up your immune system to also attack the bad actors that before it might not have seen like the fungus under my toenails. Those are, uh, the D3 uh, revs up your immune system. It makes it so it can see well, and it, it also kills off cancer cells before they can uh, uh, spread or replicate into a much bigger problem. It kills off uh, any infections. So, all right, so I'll, I'll leave it at that because I know you're, you've got something to say there. <laughs> <laughs> fun. So, um, 
and and you know we don't have time to get into everything but you do you know mention all you know a lot of of benefits of, of vitamin D we've, we've touched on some but um, before we move on uh, to some of the cofactors which I do want to get into briefly um, I want to get into just some of the practical applications of using vitamin D uh, you know as a physician I'm gonna recommend people get you know a baseline level just so oh yeah that's that's the smart somewhere. thing to do I, I didn't do it that way yeah uh, and 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 I I check that again. A lot of physicians don't even check that. Matter of fact, most don't even check that. I, I think I'm in the minority. But but so I'm going to recommend to listeners, you know, if you're interested in doing this, to get a baseline level level number one. So with that, so once you get a baseline level, um, I mean, what give us some recommendations on just you know daily daily dosing, and then again we're going to get into to the other cofactors here in a minute. But just for vitamin D, give us some recommendations on daily dosing. All right. Well, there's one doctor in Germany. He he has his patients take 100,000 units a day for seven days, and then he puts them down on a maintenance dose of 10 or 20,000 a day. And he actually wrote his book, and it's been translated into English, and you can get it on Amazon. It's called Healthy in Seven Days. That's one way you could do it. Uh, the way I did it was I just now went is, right. Is, is is oh. this for people who are really, really low, like they're less than 30 or even in the teens? I don't – I, I, he just does it for everybody. It's like fill the tank, and then uh, he, he wants people to get their blood levels up to like 90 to 100 for the rest of their life. Okay. And then um, – but that's one way to do it. The way I did it, I just started taking 20, 25,000 a day, and uh, – and – and I went for three months and, and all this stuff happened at that level. And I, and you got to adjust it for your weight. I, I was taking that when I weighed about 180, 190 pounds, but everyone should adjust it for their weight unless they're going to, but if you're doing blood testing, it, it's much more precise. Um, and then after you've been doing it for a while, you should test your blood calcium along with the D3. In fact, the D3 is almost irrelevant as long as it's high enough that you just have to watch your uh, calcium. And then um, some people, there are pro some people have problems right up, right off the bat when they take high doses of D three. In fact, I got an email from a man who whose woman was doing or his woman his, whose wife was uh, taking that hundred thousand a day, and but under the under other doctor, and he said, "Oh my God, my my wife has this horrible heart palpitations and they put her in the emergency room. The doctors want to give her a pacemaker. And I said, no, don't do that. I said, uh, just stop the D3. What's going on now is she's, mag she's magnesium deficient like most people are. And the high dose D3 is really aggravating the underlying magnesium deficiency and that's causing the arrhythmia. So just uh, start mega dose, dosing her on magnesium at least two or three times a day. You can't do it all at once or you get diarrhea. So you have to take it throughout the day, do it for a week or two, and then she can take the D3 again. So he did that and she was fine and avoided uh, heart surgery. So that's one. So it, most people, if they have any problem initially with high dose D3, it means they're magnesium deficient and that can show up. Uh, there's, I would say vitamin D3 deficiency is involved with causing about 75% of most diseases of humans. And I would say magnesium deficiency accounts for about 20% more. And a lot of the possibilities you can get by D3 can cause magnesium deficiency aggravation. I've heard of one guy, he was taking uh, 20,000 a day to cure his plantar fasciitis. And it, D3 will knock that out in two weeks. Um, when people limp around for years it's, and, and you tell them about that, they're like, oh, that's BS. They don't believe it. And then they do it and they're, they feel stupid. <laughs> but um, so one guy was taking 20,000 a day for his plantar fasciitis and he had a panic attack for the first time in his life. And that's, a, that's another symptom of D3, uh, magnesium deficiency, anxiety, uh, blood pressure changes. There's a huge list. It's in my book. Um, and then the most severe cases is uh, one guy started hallucinating and got dizzy and was falling down. He had to close his business for a while and the doctors couldn't diagnose him. 
So if you have any problems in the beginning taking high dose D3, it means you're aggravating your magnesium deficiency and you, you need to yeah. stop the D3 and load up on magnesium before you do it again. And, and I agree. Yeah, and I agree with you. Most people are magnesium deficient, and, and you're exactly right. You can't really test that, and, and so it's hard to know. Um, I usually recommend about 400 milligrams of magnesium every night. Uh, what what do you recommend, and do you recommend a specific form of magnesium? There's a lot of different forms out there. Yeah, I was taking all during the high-dose D3. I was always taking like uh, 250 or 500 milligrams of magnesium a day, and I thought that was enough. And that, that wasn't because the, the high dose D3, it eats it up. So, um, and I had, oh, about eight years into my D, high dose D3 experiment, I got kind of a frozen shoulder and I just couldn't get rid of it. I thought the D3 was, would, it wasn't working for some reason. And I, I came across, it turns out ten, to cure tendonitis or frozen shoulders, uh, that's also a symptom of magnesium deficiency. So even though I was taking like 400 a day, it wasn't enough with the amount of D3 I was taking. So for about a year, I started taking 500 milligrams twice a day, plus some magnesium three and eight that gets into your brain and helps with any uh, uh, mental issues. I don't have any mental issues except that I'm crazy, <laughs> um, uh, cra crazy about medicine. Um, but like some people that have anxiety or agoraphobia, like there's all sorts of uh, uh, weird mental conditions that are associated with magnesium deficiency, like most of them, like psychosis, uh, just you name it. It's in, it there's a long list in my book. And um, the magnesium three and eight, that passes the blood brain barrier. So if, if you've got any of those uh, anxiety issues, uh, you, you want to take that also along with regular magnesium. But I like magnesium that stays in your blood a long time. So the Life Extension Foundation sells a extended release magnesium. And I think other people sell it too. And, and that has like some of it's coated so it doesn't get released for a little bit later. And so that stays in your blood for six hours and it reduces your uh, chance of getting diarrhea. Because, you know, the, the number one, ingredient in laxatives is magnesium <clears throat> that's that's what you drink before you have your colonoscopy if you've ever done that but um so you want to spread that out during the day so that's why i take magnesium extended release magnesium twice a day so that that contains magnesium citrate and then a another one i forgot that that's the one that's encapsulated but uh just plain old magnesium, what is it, oxide or something? That That's not that good. It, that's one, yep. It, it just, yep. That, yep. that one can give you diarrhea a lot easier than the others. And then Epsom salt is basically so, pure magnesium. Right, right, yeah. Um, you, you mentioned in your book, uh, and, and I had that at the first, that the five deadly deficiencies of the modern age are vitamin D3, which we talked about, magnesium, Next on the list is vitamin K2, uh, which um, is very important, uh, and, and I recommend anybody take that with, with vitamin D, and I'm, I'm still not doing like super high doses of vitamin D yet. But So what, why is that important to take along with the vitamin D? Uh, vitamin K2, uh, is a, it, it basically recharges this hormone called osteocalcin, and what osteocalcin does is it just sits around and when there's calcium in your blood it grabs it when it's charged up with k2 it grabs the calcium out of your blood and puts it back in your bones and so it doesn't accumulate in your soft tissues and if you're the vitamin d3 uses up your vitamin k2 doing all its uh handiwork and when you're when you've exhausted your k2 osteocalcin works in reverse and it takes calcium out of your bones and puts it in your blood so if you take a lot of d3 for a long time uh, it eats up your k2 just like it eats up magnesium and uh, that's how you get hypercalcemia and that's what doctors scare you with like oh you're gonna calcify your kidneys and this and that but it's really very rare uh even people taking high doses of d3 like fifty thousand a day 
I've never heard of hypercalcemia. I've, you can get kidney stones. I've heard of people taking 50,000 a day of D3 and no K2. Uh, just, I've heard of two cases after six months, they both got kidney stones, but one had it run in their family. And then, uh, and then if you take really high doses of D3 with no K2, you can get that hypercalcemia. I do know of a guy taking 1 million international units a day every day to uh, treat his primary progressive multiple sclerosis. But he takes a lot of K2 and a lot of magnesium and uh, his calcium always tests normal. And he used to be an, he actually fought uh, the heavyweight champion of the world. He's an ex heavyweight boxer. For Zoran, Zoran, I forgot his last name. It'll come to me. But um, yeah, so, so K2 is very important. But even if uh, even if you were taking 20,000 a day, you don't really need the K2 for the hypercalcemia risk. Uh, if you're taking 50,000 a day, you'd want to take a K2 uh, to avoid kidney stone risk. Kidney stones aren't that, you know, they're painful. They're not that uh, dangerous, but it's not fun to get them. And if you're taking higher than 50,000, you definitely need, you want K2 to avoid hypercalcemia. And then the other thing, a great thing about K2 is uh, people who, it decalcifies your soft tissues and it helps with osteoporosis because it's putting calcium back in your bones. And in Japan, they, they, taking, uh, they, they gave people 45 milligrams a day for osteoporosis and it worked quite well. And then it can also, if you've got calcified arteries and veins, which many people do when they're older, you can actually go on a, a course of high dose K2 and some D3 and over like two or three month period, it'll, it'll decalcify your veins and arteries. Um, but 45 milligrams, they usually measure K2 in micrograms and you, know, you should take uh, 400 micrograms of the of K2 uh, with every 10,000 units of D3. But if you're decalcifying your arteries and veins, you can take 45,000 micrograms a day or three times a day. There's really no toxicity to K2. And uh, that's actually sounds like a lot, but it's, it's the same as saying 45 milligrams. So it, it sounds like is if somebody is a little leery to oh oh oh, oh, oh there's oh this high dose of vitamin D. wait wait one last one last really cool thing about vitamin K two is uh, there was a guy named Doctor Weston Price he went around he he was a dentist and he traveled the world looking trying to figure out why the English had such bad teeth and and other Europeans and he went to all these island countries like natives on islands and they all had perfect teeth they never brushed their teeth or flossed and everyone in Europe had all these crooked teeth and uh, he couldn't figure out why so he figured out there was something he called it factor x that they got from their diet because and it, it's from the animal products uh, the animals they raised they would eat uh, spring and summer grass instead of uh, in Europe, they had switched to feeding animals like corn and uh, wheat or whatever. But it's uh, the animals that ate the uh, uh, the summer grass. Um, they had. It turns out, factor X is vitamin K two, and that, so you get milk and butter from cows that eat summer grass, and it's like an orange color. That's because it's full of vitamin K two. And it turns out, uh, these islanders uh, they ate they had enough K2 in their diet where the kids, their jaw bones would grow larger uh, to the size they're supposed to be. And, but if you're K2 deficient, your jaw bone as a kid does not grow big enough. So when the teeth come in, they come in all crooked and crowded and that's why you need braces. So if everyone gives their kids K2 uh, when they're young, when their teeth are coming in, uh, you probably will never need braces. Interesting. So that's a that's a nice little benefit of K two. So I was going to ask if somebody... oh and that and that's the that's the secret of grass fed beef. That's why it's healthy for you. Yeah, no, I've, I've yeah I've read that. So if someone is leery to take these higher doses of vitamin D, worried about you know some kind of side effect, as long as they're taking vitamin K two, I mean they probably have nothing to worry about. Correct. K K two and magnesium. Yeah. yeah the okay. the first any 
first negative effects you're going to get is almost always going to be a uh, magnesium deficiency symptoms. And some of them are like really weird, like your legs swell up or when you're sitting down, there's, there's a bunch of weird ones. You got to look at my book. It's like two pages of symptoms. Gotcha. Different okay. symptoms. Um, okay. Well, so the, the, the next one that you mentioned as far as the deficiencies of the modern age is boron. Uh, so, so it's a, it's a cofactor for fight for a vitamin D. So just, just briefly talk about, you know, boron and, and what we can do to correct. Yeah. I, I looked up boron deficiency in humans and I could barely find, I basically, I looked up D3 and what are all the cofactors? Boron was one of them. Um, and I started looking up boron deficiency and it, it only refers to plants almost. There's almost no data on, uh, humans and boron deficiency. It's like almost completely not researched except there was this one guy named max nedham i think uh is his name something like that and he was a plant botanist in england he moved to australia to study plants and their boron deficiency and uh, he noticed he got arthritis and uh he'd never had it before never in his family and so he got the idea that boron deficiency caused arthritis so he started doing uh studies on it um, and he started taking borax, which is a laundry detergent that makes your clothes whiter, but it's basically pure boron. And, uh, he started taking one eighth a teaspoon of that twice a day. And he noticed it, it cured his arthritis in about, uh, oh, like a couple months. And then, uh, he just started doing research. He went all over the world and tested boron in the soils. And he discovered that, uh, in any lands where the boron level is low there's like a like 70 percent of the humans might have arthritis and and the dogs have it and then places where boron levels are high in the soil like there's only five percent incident of arthritis and there's the dogs don't get arthritic so and then he did some tests on a few people and it was uh got great results and that's uh i mentioned those now, those are like the only experiments ever done with boron that I can tell. And then he finally passed. Oh, and then he started selling a borax. He put it in pills and was selling it to everyone in Australia. And it was just growing by word of mouth. And before you know it, he's like selling like 4,000 bottles a month in Australia. And he approached the pharmaceutical company and said, hey, you want to market this? And uh, we'll make a lot of money. They looked into it and said, oh, we can't patent it. And they told the government... And then the government outlawed borax. <laughs> so, but uh, so apparently D3 is using up your boron as well. Okay. And uh, like any other cofactor. And I, I had a real old German shepherd. That she weighed 120 pounds. And I started giving her boron. And within, uh, God, within a, I didn't even notice it, but after two or three months, she'd lost like 30 or 40 pounds. She got down to 80 or 90 without, and, and she kind of, and in the beginning, she had like a much, a lot more energy. And I looked into it and I, it turns out boron also somehow affects your insulin sensitivity. So hmm. in some people it might help for weight loss. Is there a recommended amount of boron or if, if somebody takes a multivitamin, would they get enough boron in that? No, no. Yeah. As usual, the, the medical authorities just say, well, three milligrams a day, uh, won't be bad, uh, it is safe, mm -hmm. but they, they don't really look into like what's optimal and, um, you know, and then they, they talk about, oh, it could be be careful. It could be toxic at higher doses, but I looked at into it and the, the lethal dose of uh, boron is 50 grams. So if you ate 50 grams of it, it would kill you. But that sounds scary, but table salt, the lethal dose of table salt is 25 grams. So I'm not too scared of boron. Mm -hmm. So I, I've just, I was taking like 30 milligrams twice a day. You know, so that'd be like, they, they want you to take they want you to take one pill of three milligrams so i, I was taking 10 of those twice a day oh or or you could switch to borax uh, laundry detergent if you want to save money I, <laughs> you do your own research I mean, it says on the box not for human consumption or whatever but uh but no that's what that a lot of people take borax if you want to save money but that's up to you you can always buy the vitamins and sp spend a lot more money
Sure. Okay. Um, so last thing you talk about is zinc as another cofactor for vitamin D. Uh, you know, I, I know of zinc just in uh, aiding in the immune system, actually helping uh, with the sex hormones like testosterone. Um, but, but talk about zinc and why you mentioned it in, in the book. Well, it turns out our soils are zinc deficient too. So the reason there's all these, we all have all these deficiencies is because our soils are depleted of magnesium, boron and zinc over the years that the farming practices, they don't, uh, they don't uh, grow food for proper nutrition. They like to, they like uh, farmers like plants that grow really fast into nice big looking, uh, you know, nice looking fruits and vegetables, but they don't, they don't really monitor the, the nutrient content. You're, so you're better off eating organic that looks kind of nasty, but th th that'll have more nutrients for you. So basically the entire agricultural soil is deficient in these minerals. Zinc is one of them and we're probably all zinc deficient and we don't realize it. And the reason I say that is because uh, your thymus is pretty big when you're young and it's, it, that's what makes your killer T cells. And um, that shrinks, it starts shrinking like as a teenager and it just keeps shrinking and shrinking. And by the time you're 65, your thymus is like one sixth the size it used to be. And it's, uh, and at that point, many people can't even make uh, new T cells when challenged with a new virus. And that's why older people's immune, another reason people's uh, older people's immune systems are bad. And that's why zinc is good for your immune system. It turns out they gave uh, zinc and melatonin uh, or zinc and arginine, uh, either or. And, and the third one is zinc and, and quercetin. You can use any one of those with zinc, but they're giving it to elderly mice and they, they found out it rejuvenated their thymus gland to like, and it grew back. So they always thought the thymus involution or shrinkage was uh, caused by aging, but it's more likely, it seems more likely it's caused by a depletion of our zinc pools over time. And uh, so that's one thing that uh, we definitely need to take more of. They tell us, you know, the, again, they tell you, oh, don't 50 milligrams of zinc is safe, but there's people that, uh, in certain areas of the world that eat a lot more zinc than that and have no problems. So I take 200 milligrams of zinc a day. And that, oh, wow. I think the best one, according to my vitamin guy, I didn't research it much, but I got a guy that's a vitamin expert. He said zinc picolinate mm -hmm. is the one that's most absorbable. And so if you are zinc deficient, there's some, you get, uh, oh, so like if you take a lot of D3 over time, you're going to get zinc deficiency symptoms. And that happened to me after about four or five, now maybe about seven or eight years of high dose D3. I got this like patch of an alopecia on the back of my head and I couldn't figure out what it was. I'm like putting Rogaine on it. And I'm like, why is this happening? I'm taking melatonin, which makes your hair grow, but it didn't, didn't work on that patch. And I started looking up zinc deficiency symptoms. One of them is alopecia. And then I saw uh, on, there's an internet site that shows a woman who was zinc deficient, who had a same alopecia patch on the back of her head. It's got a before and after picture. And after she was on zinc for like uh, seven, eight months, the, her hair grew back completely fine. And uh, what else? Like, uh, like cracked lips. Uh, there's a, a number of symptoms that it's in my book. But I mean, they're not as dramatic as the magnesium deficiency symptoms, but it's something you want to uh, look out for. So if you're taking D3, you should supplement with all, all these four cofactors. And then there's a final one is vitamin A is a cofactor, but you don't want to take the retinol form. Uh, that is too strong. And actually high doses of retinol will interfere with vitamin D3's health benefits. And it turns out... Uh, Vitamin D3 protects against almost all cancers, except in people that take high doses of retinol, um, <clears throat> because that negates the anti-cancer effects of uh, vitamin D. And 
according to Dr. Who, who did that? I think it was Dr. Mercola that figured that out. He was looking at some studies. Mm -hmm. He used to recommend vitamin A and he said, don't take vitamin A. It's, it's not good for you. Instead, take beta carotene because that, that won't convert to vitamin A uh, unless your body needs it. So, so that would be the final cofactor. And then uh, what else? Oh, there's uh, in the book that you read, there, I got a chapter on cancer. And there's a number of people, there's, the, there's a woman who had terminal pancreatic cancer, an 85-year-old Iranian woman. They sent her home to die, and uh, they checked on her nine months later, and she said, I've never felt better in my life. <laughs> and they looked in her pancreas, and her tumors were, like, shrinking, and she was going into remission. I said, well, what are you doing? And he, she said, oh, I've been taking... Uh, 10 of these pills a day that my homeopath told me to take. Turns out the homeopath, I think, told her only to take one pill a day, but so she was actually accidentally taking 50,000 units a day of vitamin D3. Hmm. And, uh, and there's another case in there. It's anecdotal about a woman, young woman with a terminal ovarian cancer who claims she just took, start at her brother's advice, she went, she went home to die, and, and her brother's advice as a last-ditch attempt started taking 50,000 units of D3 a day, and she went into complete remission. So that's another interesting aspect I need to study. Well, very good. Well, my uh, take-home message from all of this is just to be much more aggressive about taking vitamin D and the cofactors. And since, since reading this and Dr. Somerville's book, I, I realized that that I'm not being aggressive enough as a physician in recommending vitamin D, you know, for myself, uh, I, I don't take any in the summer and in the winter I would take 5,000 units a day but ah. after learning all this, I realized I'm, I mean, it's, it's a little and nothing. And so I have, uh, you know, just since reading this, I have started taking more, uh, personally, um, I've, I've already, you know, I had already been on, uh, magnesium, and, you know, I take K2 along with my vitamin D. So uh, I, I guess I would recommend for people, number one, know what your vitamin D levels are. So get a baseline and, um, you know, probably start taking some higher doses of vitamin D. And I think as long as you're taking these cofactors, you're probably going to be fine. And monitor it. Uh, um, you know, work with your physician. If you're working with somebody like me, I'm more than open to, to monitor those levels. But monitor your levels over time so, so you know where you're at. And did, did you say, do you like levels around a hundred? Is there a, a level yeah, there? yeah. Let me, let me give you a, a, a little more, uh, uh, perspective on that. So yeah, at a hundred, hundred ninety to a hundred is great for permanent health for the rest of your life. But if you want to like cure things, uh, cure, you, you can cure allergies. Uh, it took, I cured my allergies, seasonal allergies. It took like a two years to completely cure them. Uh, um, but basically, uh, you need to have blood levels of 125 to 150 to actually cure autoimmune diseases or higher. Um, I know of one woman who has Crohn's disease. She had it for 50 years and she got her blood levels up to 150 in England. The doctor said, stop it. It's toxic. It's toxic. But that cured her Crohn's of uh, 50 years. And then so she listened to them and her blood level came down to 100 and her Crohn's came back at 100. So some people need a higher dose, like even a higher level up to 150. Now don't let, it doesn't sound, it shouldn't sound too scary. They, they test the blood of lifeguards in the summer, like in Florida, and they, they regularly test out at 125. So it's not like you're doing anything totally crazy. It's, it's, you're boosting your blood levels up to lifeguard levels on the beach. And then uh, as far as a dosing goes, just they, they renamed it 1 million international units for a reason so that, so you're talking about big numbers and it sounds scary. So like, oh, 5,000 sounds scary. You know, I was, I thought 4,000 sounds scary when, when I, when, when they were saying the recommended maximum dose per day is 400, yeah. you know, you think, oh, I'm doing 4,000. Well, it turns out a Dr. Halleck, he, he discovered vitamin D. He's like the leading researcher on it. He did a little test with people. Uh, he had them sit in the sun just long enough till their skin turned pink. And 
the pinkness went away after 24 hours. So that would be like a half hour sunbathing. Um, he called that one erythmal dose. So I guess it varies in per person in different people, like how much sun you need to get to that. And so he, uh, he found out uh, one erythmal dose, or basically a half hour sunbathing, uh, caused uh, your skin to generate uh, oh, around 20,000 international units. So 20,000 units is the same as sunbathing for a half hour. So that should make it sound a little less scary. Sure, okay. Oh, and that's, and that's sunbathing at, uh, at, at 48 degrees north. So that's like at the border of Canada and the US. So it, it also you can you can make that much in the weak sun of Finland, but when you get further south, like in the Florida sun, it's going to make uh, uh, that 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 stronger sun will make more D three in your skin than than if you're up north. Well, as far as the type or the brand of vitamins, uh, many of my patients know I recommend Thorn. Um, I don't know if you use Thorn, but I use Thorn, and so um, the highest they're going to have, like most people, is going to be 10,000 units of vitamin D. Uh, so obviously, you're going to have to take multiple ones of that if you're going to do the higher doses. And I'll, in my show notes, I'll put a link to Thorn with uh, with my uh, physician number on there. So if you want to use that to to order some. Um, so how can how can people find you? Well, you can go to my website. It's got a bunch of neat, a lot of neat articles about people who've cured various diseases. It's got case studies. It's got like 60 different blog posts. Like, uh, it's got one like uh, vitamin high dose D3 cures acne when Accutane does not. Um, a woman cures myasthenia gravis with 100,000 units of D3 a day. One doctor cured his ulcerative colitis an Italian heart surgeon, the drugs didn't work and he took a hundred thousand a day for 10 months and it cured it. And it's got my, there, that's a blog post uh, with my, his discussion. And then, then there's got the search engine with like a, a thousand self-reported case studies. So you can just pop whatever condition you've got, you can pop it into the search engine there and uh, you'll, you, you can read page after page. And of, what, what is, what is that website? Can you uh, it's Jeff T. Bowles, B O W L E S dot com. So it's just one big, there's no spaces, just Jeff T. Bowles. Okay. That's my middle initial. And I'll put that, uh, I'll put that in the show <laughs> as well. Yeah. And, and then, then uh, I've got books on Amazon. You can just search Jeff Bowles on Amazon and you might want, <coughs> hey, Hanky. Oh, that's, I've got a dog <coughs> here. Hey, Hanky, no. <laughs> that's my little. I actually cloned my dog. He passed away a year and a half. He's the first cloned dog in the St. Louis area. But um, yeah, so uh, yeah, you can get the books um, on Amazon. Now I'm giving away a free book for anyone that wants it. It was banned by Amazon, but it's uh, got all five star reviews, but it violated CDC guidelines. They didn't want anyone contradicting the CDC, which are a bunch of idiots. Um, sorry, <laughs> um, but I will email it to you as a PDF file. If you send it, you can go to jefftbowles.com. Look at the first blog post. It talks about this book. It gives you two sample chapters and it gives you my email address where you can email me and I'll send you a free copy of the PDF for you to uh, share it with all your friends. It's, uh, it's titled 16 fascinating uh, COVID-19 and Spanish flu mysteries solved. And once you read that, you're going to know way more than Dr. Fauci about how to, how to handle uh, COVID-19. And you'll, <laughs> you'll have, you, you can throw your mask in the garbage and go around and lick doorknobs and not worry at all. Very nice. All right. <laughs> um, so I always end my interviews by asking, asking my guest if you could give us one health tip that can make us healthier today obviously we're talking about vitamins and it can be that or something else but what would you tell the listeners if you just had to say one one tip that can make us healthier <clears throat> well uh you can get all this and stuff out of my books um i'll give you one that's not in my books but i've haven't been to the dentist in 20 years and i haven't had any i don't floss anymore and i used to have bleeding gums uh, receding gums uh, toothaches cavities and uh, after I started taking 
D3 and K2 and one other, uh, one other substance, uh, I never had to go to the dentist again, and I don't think you will either. It's called CoQ10. I'm sure you know about it, Doc. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, if you look on the internet, type in uh, uh, type in got teeth and gums and CoQ10. You'll see it's like a miracle substance. Uh, if you ever have a gum ache or toothache, uh, bite a gel cap of CoQ10, rub it on that for a, a, until it goes away. It might take about a week. And then if you're taking oral CoQ10 along with your D3 and K2, you can say goodbye to the dentist. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Well, that sounds good. That's a uh, nice health tip. <laughs> yeah, that is. Well, uh, thank you, Jeff, for enlightening us on vitamin D and all the other um, – cofactors uh and uh we just appreciate your time did we go over 30 minutes uh we did but that's okay <laughs> <laughs> all right well uh thanks guys thanks for listening and uh we will um visit with you all next time